course, our CEO took this time to text me, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll <have to> wait. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. Well, um, uh, I'm Amy Carter. Welcome to the, I'm the Vice President of Member Services and Business Development at the Distilled Spirits Council of the U.S., Austin and Discus. <clears throat> Uh, welcome to our uh, Ask the Experts webinar series. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, we're going to be recording this webinar, so it will be available later on the uh, Discus YouTube channel. Um, but today, I want to welcome our speakers, Scott Super, Business Development Manager, Connected Packaging at Avery Dennison. And Chris Brain, founder and CEO of Stellar. Um, Hi, everyone. And, and Chris is calling in from Australia. <laughs> so many thanks for him. It's actually morning for him and afternoon for us. Um, but the contact information for both Scott and Chris will be available on the last slide so that everyone can access it once we post the webinar to the Discus YouTube channel. Um, we do, uh, Chris, if you wouldn't mind going to the um, slide. I want to make sure that everyone uh, gets a chance to see, and I will read the uh, Discus Antitrust Policy Statement, which we say at the outset of all of our events. Um, we ask that people refrain from discussing uh, or exchanging information relating to pricing, marketing or sales plans, costs or confidential plans regarding output or production, boycotting or uh, boycotting another company, not recruiting or hiring each other's employees or salaries, wages or benefits or any other competitively sensitive or proprietary business information. Uh, so with that, that's our sort of uh, housekeeping. Um, I just want to tell, since we've got uh, Discus members and some others on, on, the, on the webinar here, um, I just want to say that Discus is the leading voice and advocate for our members and for the distilled spirits industry overall. Uh, Discus also provides a wealth of education, resources, data, and services for our members, uh, for our member companies. One of the resources uh, we provide is this webinar series that really aims to bring relevant discussions and opportunities to members and to Discus members and to others who um, are interested in the distilled spirits industry. So with that, um, our, the last webinar we did, which was on January 25th, was on the alcohol buying trends of socially conscious consumers. And so we're sort of continuing, um, today's webinar is kind of continuing that theme of engaging uh, consumers. Uh, and so we'll get into that in a second, but I'm first gonna um, preview the format of today's webinar. Um, Scott, Chris and I will have a conversation about 30 minutes and then we'll open to questions, but you can feel free to ask a question at any time by using the raise your hand icon at the top of the screen or just put your question in the chat and myself or Caleb Ross who works with me on, member, on membership at Discus, um, someone will try and get your question and, and get it answered throughout. Uh, so with that, hopefully we've got enough people who are able to get in to the webinar and we will begin. So, so Scott, I said in our prep call that I knew Avery from the labels <laughs> back in the day, but I hadn't realized that the company had grown into so much more. So in case anyone else out there is like me, can you provide an overview of Avery Dennison and why you're involved in connected packaging and, and is, what is connected packaging? Sure, and th thank you very much. And thank you, Discus, for having us at this webinar on a very emerging and exciting topic. Avery Dennison was founded in 1935 by an individual by the name of Stan Avery. Stan invented the world's first pressure sensitive adhesive label. Over like the next 89 years, that labeling technology and his invention revolutionized the way brands were displayed on store shelves. During the same time, Avery Dennison grew to about a $9 billion company in 2022, and along the way, we became the leader in digital labeling technology. That technology is really, I would call it cutting edge in that it allows you to connect the physical to the digital using you know, basically digital triggers like QR codes, NF NFC and RFID labels and tags, as well as Bluetooth enabled digital labels and tags. 
From there, we able to integrate through our hardware and our software. And with global scale and support, we put together a digital ladling technology using our Atma IO cloud, where we, we pull all the information up and send the information back in the format the customer wants. And that is pretty much how digital labeling works today. But we do have um, hardware and software available for everybody as far as getting that done in, in the future. And also uh, we, we have the technical solutions people that go out and help. So we bring 85 years of experience to bear on all that we do. We have four pillars of excellence. The first is material science. We literally supply material labels to much of the world and the industries and including the spirits industry today. We are the leader in digital labeling technology to include, we manufacture our own RFID labels and digital labels. We have a data management cloud, which is key to making sure that you can access and get marketing information, but that digital cloud basically is allowed to capture and then it takes the data and puts it into some useful information form, which you can use. And it's usually directed by the customer as to what type of information they would like to see. And finally, we have an integration process where we have the personnel and the equipment worldwide to help everybody get going with this type of process. I have included on this presentation, all of the different website links to uh, uh, different pieces of technology expert expertise. But I did also want to take you to uh, quickly our website to show you a little bit of what it could do for you. So our website in a nutshell allows brands to capitalize on trends and keep consumers engaged and their packaging vibrant. You can see the address there. You can find things like trends. You can request samples. You can discover technical guides. And most of all, you can see this wide ranging portfolio of materials that is really awesome. I'll also mention that we have a, a marketing presentation on brand storytelling, which is really second to none. And I highly recommend that you watch it if you can. So on the you, back to you, Amy and Chris on his side. That's a bit about Avery Dennison. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and so I know, um, Chris, I didn't do say anything about seller in, in the beginning, although I know you've been at the previous Discus conference, uh, but I think you're a better storyteller than I am. <laughs> so can you provide an overview of seller and the company's role in connected packaging? Of course. So my name is Chris, and as we mentioned earlier, I've called in here from Australia. So uh, if anyone needs subtitles, we can probably work through the chat perhaps to convert some of my language cues that might uh, might be a little bit strange to most. But at Seller, we believe in a future where every product serves as a gateway to a dynamic, interactive and personalized journey. Our mantra really sits around connect, engage and grow. So we connect physical products to digital experiences at scale so that brands can deliver amazing direct to consumer engagement, true brand protection and compliance with ease in that digital compliance space. So recent data that we've been looking at, um, one of the consumer surveys showed that around 88% of customers say that the experience that a company provides is as important as its products or services themselves, which is a staggering number. And the reason why connected products are one of the primary problems that we solve, specifically targeting the direct consumer marketing landscape. The second global problem that we really focus on, is all around trust, authentication and brand protection. So 53% of customers have said, they'd be prepared to pay more for a connected product, which means that brand protection and any counterfeits no longer seen as a cost of goods, but a valuable piece of the marketing budget. And finally, the compliance world. So the world is really changing pretty rapidly when it comes to legislation applied to alcohol. So we knew that digital compliance was soon to be critical. So the mantra connect relates to the chosen digital triggers placed on products and assets during manufacturing, as Scott touched on, QR codes, NFC tags, low energy Bluetooth, RFID. There's a really large choice that can be made in that landscape. The engage component covers all the amazing digital consumer experiences that you can create once you've connected these products. 
And then the grow piece is all about this powerful analytics to grow consumer behaviors so that brands can make stra uh, smarter strategic decisions. Thanks both of you for those overviews. And, and you know, Chris, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned uh, sort of the global regulatory environment that's increasingly complex. And I say that because our next webinar um, is going to be specifically on that issue. It's like a great tie in, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but so, so for both of you, you know, it seems like um, connecting physical products to digital experiences, you know, seems fairly straightforward. You can just connect a QR code or to web page or print a QR code on a bottle. So, you know, why wouldn't brands just do this on their own? Um, do it themselves. Maybe Scott, maybe start with you and then. Chris, you get the cleanup. Yeah, I'll start with I'll start with the answer on that. Sure, thanks. A brand could do that. You can take a static QR code and print it on a can, like you see here on this slide. And what that static QR code then is, it, when someone scans it with their cell phone, then they're directed to a website, and that website asks the consumer to fill out information that either you do or you don't get as a brand because it is really up to the consumer to fill that information out. If you, if the brand wants meaningful data that can be then used in marketing the product to consumers, you're best to use a, uh, basically a serialized Q, QR code or uh, NFC tag or a dynamic QR code where the data is actually collected so you can get that information back and know where it was scanned, how many times it was scanned, to you know, to all kinds of different other attribute data, which would be important almost in every situation. And it is also important when you're running contest games and all that type of thing. So we highly recommend at the very least using these dynamic QR codes, because you've got to have those type of codes, either those or NFC tags, so that you can gauge, engage a data management system like ours that's at my own. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, so um, it's it's an interesting landscape, connecting a QR code to a web page. I've often spoken about this as being a perfect starting place. Problem is that technology has come so far and it's actually been, I guess, wiped out as really a good choice. Consumers are smart. Smartphone users these days are really clever and having your website linked up is just something that they could actually do themselves really easily. Look, don't be, uh, don't be afraid of just connecting it to the website and getting started. In some cases, we'll absolutely agree with that sentiment, but we built this solution in Seller and what Atma and Avery are doing as well to be a DIY solution, to make it a lot easier for brands to connect these products at scale, giving you that central cloud platform so that you can really control what goes on within these different connected products. So thinking about for a second, having that QR code linked to a web page, and one of the, well, a few of the main reasons why we would recommend going more of a dynamic avenue is about controlling your messaging uh, using things like geotargeting. Let's say you want to run a campaign that's uh, delivering brand new brand information in one of the different states within the US or in a country that you guys are exporting to. Or you might be then wanting to have a different message for another part of the country or a different part of the world to do with ESG and what you're doing in that space. You can start to control these experiences through a connected product cloud, which you simply can't do using a website. That website's not smart enough to know that that user that's picked up your product and scanned it with their phone in California is different to the one that's in Japan or in the UK or here in Australia, for example. With platforms like Seller and Atma, we can determine those different spots these users are coming from and actually deliver them content that's totally relevant to the journey that they're on. Things like um, Scott mentioned about the serialization component. So what that means is that each product becomes unique within a system, it's got a unique ID. So you've got this ability to run brand protection or uh, competitions, giveaways, redemptions. You can get really clever with the way you start to use these connected products within that landscape once they're all individualized within the system. You can start to think about then product recalls, which nobody really wants 
Obviously, we want our products to be as um, in the best state as physically possible, but from time to time, a recall needs to happen. And when you've got control of your products through this connected platform, you've got an uh, easy ability to be able to deliver the content to those products that are under a recall circumstance, for example, because of the batch that they've gone under. You can do set and forget content timers for different parts of the year, Valentine's Day or Christmas or Father's Day or Mother's Day, whatever it might be. You can do A-B testing if there's marketers in the room. So testing this message in this landscape and then a different message in this landscape, starting to really control that journey. So really about these cloud platforms, giving you guys control over these connected product suites, a hub, centralized hub, so you can combine all these data sets that come in and really start to control the way you're delivering these experiences whilst collecting really, really valuable data. So connecting the product is the start of this magical journey, but don't shortcut, don't shortcut this piece as it will actually limit what you can potentially do into the future. Yeah, that was super helpful. I appreciate that. Um, I learned even a little bit more from our uh, prep calls. So, oh, so thanks. Um, so, you know, speaking of data, uh, you know, data shows us that a large percentage of consumers expect brands to engage with them in meaningful ways through techniques like personalization, loyalty, instant gratification. I can attest that my personal preferences change based on where I usually shop, what I'm doing at a given time, how I'm feeling, um, but I don't like a lot of noise. And there's a lot of noise out there. We're all, you know, getting, there's a lot of stuff just being we're bombarded with a lot of stuff. So my understanding of Seller and the Atma IO platforms is that y'all allow, you allow brands to easily deploy global connected product strategies. So how can Discus members and others sort of, I don't know, supercharge their engagement strategies using your technologies? Chris? Yeah, love it. So I guess the big thing here is having choice to start with, but also the ability to deliver meaningful content is exactly what you touched on in the lead in here but the, the, the key to a successful connect product strategy in our humble opinion is delivering meaningful content to your target audience in the moment that they're in so whether that's a pre-sale conversation that you can have through your label or a post-sale engagement opportunity you can have once that product has been purchased so let's say a consumer picks up a product on the shelf they might scan the qr code or tap the nfc tag because they want to learn more about the product they may want to get nutritional information to make a different, healthier choice, or they may want to know more about the ESG targets or footprint that the brand is working towards. The production processes, I mean, we all know what goes into making these amazing products, and often that story is a little bit lost once the product hits, hits the shelf. The label can do so much, right? But until you can just literally deliver that content through a beautiful experience through the tap of a phone or the scan of a label, that's when the real consumer engagement can start. Same with authentication. Do we know that this product is real? We can scan it, we can tap it, we can enter unique codes or use that unique ID, the serialization we touched on for brand protection and authentication to give consumers that trusted um, understanding that the product is real. Then think post-sale, claiming loyalty rewards from a retail environment. So an unknown sales channel, you can start to really engage with your consumers through connected products. Gift with purchase, redeeming something. We've got a case study that we'll talk a little bit about later from the wine industry, um, similar crossover from a competitive point of view to the spirits landscape, but we'll touch a little bit on a one-to-one -one redemption campaign at some point today. But running competitions can be really simple as well. So if you just wanna get better data collection and give your customers this instant gratification opportunity to scan a product and, and engage with it, but then have a chance to win something, you're collecting data, they're getting instant gratification, there's excitement, there's fun to be had there. You may want to do cocktail recipes so you can punch people with seasonal activities around cocktails. Um, what have you got in the cupboard, in the pantry? What could I make with this product? That kind of stuff. So you can really start to, to dive deeper into the landscape rather than just having that you know, product website page up as, the, as the, the main piece of that engagement puddle. So find that... Um, venues that that sell the product for the time well sorry you're trying to find venues that sell the product for the times they want to enjoy and what they want to get out of that product the most um plus your recyclability messaging so the list is is really endless i could waffle on all night about these kind of engagements and the screen that we've, we're sharing at the moment just touches on some of the key features that are built into a platform like seller and atma which allows you to deliver all of these amazing things 
like we mentioned before, without writing any code. There's no programming to be done. So it's a really easy to use system. Scott, I'll hand over to you. Okay, really good. So our Atma system, we switching the slides, thank you. The Atma IO system is the Avery Dennison data platform. It started as a genesis here at Avery Dennison in the belief that every product in the future is gonna have a digital identity and a digital life. These two things are key to forming connected products and connected products within the ecosystem. So we actually named Atma after, word, after the word for soul in Sanskrit. So Atma in Sanskrit means soul. And we kind of believe that the data is the soul of the product. Hence the reason that uh, it's called Atma IO today. The use of the system is really gathered a lot of momentum over the last year. Just to give you a, a bit of an example, we've had 30 billion individual instances recorded in the system. We have created 90 billion, what we call data carriers, which are anything from an RFID chip to a QR code. And we have Atma IO this actually deployed at mm -hmm. scale in 50 different countries worldwide. But that, that in and of itself is exciting, but the thing that really excites me about Atma IO is what we can do with this data and data management system in the future for our customers and for the issues that they have to deal with. So a couple of things that we're really focusing on as a, as a team are uh, well, pretty much traceability and the way that the systems and traceability handle themselves and the supply chain. Second will be uh, clarity and provenance. And the third would be anything to do with consumer engagement. So when it comes to consumer engagement, what we have, and we've partnered with Chris and his team at Seller to build the upfront piece of the digital engagement with the consumer. But at the same time, and, and by the way, Chris and his team can wow people with different things that they do, but we are always recording that within the Atma IO platforms for use in future campaigns or for use in literally um, building other, you know, building other pieces of data that we might need for marketing. So that gives you a bit about how Atma IO works. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. I Chris? imagine that um, some folks will sort of want to dig deeper into dig deeper into things. Um, so for both of you, my next question is about the rubber meeting the road or the closure to the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm dad jokes here. Uh, but it probably. relates to my previous question where I mentioned the noise because there's so much coming at us. Um, you know, and, and Chris, you mentioned that you've got some case studies. And I remember in the prep call, I was like, no, don't talk about wine. But you made some good points in terms of there are other industries where um, you know, things are happening in the other mm -hmm. industries, wine and, and, and other industries outside beverages, where yeah. um, sometimes regulations and other um, trends are going to come our way also. So just what are some actual completed case studies or, or examples of how connected packaging enables brand stories so that these brands can stand out in an increasingly competitive uh, marketing environment. I think that's something that our members will be specifically interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Chris, so this um, this first one that we've got here, we'll we'll touch on a little bit. Now, this is a project that we've been working on with the Avery Dennison teams down in Mexico, from a men's cow point of view, with this brand Fulgencio. And uh, this project really came to life as a small batch artisanal producer. So this is not about having hundreds of thousands or millions of bottles connected. It's a really small batch, but quite a unique product that really needs to tell a story. So we ended up working through the NFC channel for this one in particular. So using near field communication. So it's a little digital label that goes on each product, which has got a unique identifier built into it. Now that's a little, um, electronic sticker, as I mentioned, with your mobile phone, you can open up your screen and just tap the phone for 
communication to start the, the journey. So don't have to open your camera and, and scan on the QR code and so forth. It's very much about this contactless engagement. And with this one in particular, what we found super interesting was this 30% scan rate. Now, this is all being done, like I said, small batch artisanal producer, but there's no big supporting marketing campaigns to go side by side to explain how to use the NFC tag or what its, what its purpose is and so forth. So amazing scan rates considering that the journey itself is quite straightforward. But the thing that we were really focused on here was brand protection. So again, unique identifier for each product. So we have that ability to track and trace each individual bottle as it goes around the world. Um, the storytelling component, really telling that artisanal journey and showcasing some of the key people that are involved in making this product. Um, obviously the language is really important and that ability to, to keep that story um, from the source and make it really genuine more than anything. And again, like I said, using NFC became this reality for this brand with a small run, but a appetite to be innovative. So we took that journey on with Avery Dennison and um, that was one of the main case studies we wanted to touch on today from a NFC point of view. Now, the next one that I want to touch on, uh, Scott, have you got anything to add before I, I skip along? No, just the, the point that you could use QR or N NFC and you chose to use the NFC in this case is, and it could be either yeah. or in, in the journeys that we're going through. That's correct, yeah. So then just to, to I guess, take the, the spotlight from, um, from this spirits example here, and like we touched on with Amy in the intro here, we were umming and ahhing about whether to use some examples from wine or beer or other um, alcohol industries. But I guess the purpose that we, we did choose to keep through this journey is that this is what the competitive landscape is up to. And they're really finding ways to engage with consumers in totally different ways to the traditional methods of just storytelling. This example here is one that we've been working on with a brand here out of Australia who's, um, I think they've been around since 1889, give or take. Um, Brown Brothers, and in particular, what we found with this journey, it's all about user-generated content. And each product that went to market, there's around a million bottles in this example, had a unique ID on it, a unique QR code, which allowed you to personalize the product and gift it to somebody during the pandemic. So it was a different way to connect with individuals. Rather than the brand telling its story, we let the product tell the story that somebody wanted to craft for you as a consumer. So I'd buy a bottle, I could pick a birthday card or a different template, I could fill in a message. You'll see some of the sentiments here. Dear Holly, will you be my bride, bridesmaid? It was a really cool thing that we saw come through. People could then upload their own photos and videos, gift the bottle and give somebody an experience that they wanted them to have from that brand in particular. And then obviously enjoy the journey of, of drinking and consuming the product. And you'll see the big data call out here that 79.63% click-through rate. So people that scanned the product, nearly 80% of them went through that journey of, of um, you know, creating some user-generated content. Compare that to the 0.08% click-through rate for the same campaign social media advertising. Seriously, unbelievable recipe for success when it came to consumer engagement. So not only did we get this beautiful set of user-generated content, we also got this engaged audience and the brand itself picked up all this unbelievable first party data from their customers that are buying this off shelves and then gifting it to people during that journey. So during the campaign quarter, I think it was 21% up on sales for the brand, um, exceeded campaign targets by 147% and they picked up over 115% new customers, which was pretty cool. And we'll flick through to this next one, which is another one that we've done in conjunction with the Avery Dennison team. And Scott, do you wanna take this one? Sure, yeah, I'll take it. Um, we have a customer, actually two customers that are brewers within the Southeast United States area. And they have both, both had children recently and they wanted to give something back to their community and specifically on underadvantaged children and mothers. So they came up with their own brew and they called it Brew Daddies. I think it's kind of an, an original take on something. But the whole idea behind it was to create an experience where people would go to their website, you could click, you could literally scan the QR code and it's still active today and donate. At the same time, the brew daddy's pieces of that were 
putting some of that money into the actual charitable contribution. So not only were they able to drive awareness of their product and their brands, but they were doing something that was really socially, um, it's a, a social promotion within their own area, which they both felt very, very strong about. And this is the kind of thing that you can do with connected packaging. If you have an idea that you want to do and you literally don't know what to do, you can come to us, you can come to Chris and we can help you with it. But in this case, we just used the QR code because the QR code was sufficient enough to provide the information that they wanted to provide and the click-through rate I mean, people really want to do good things, I believe. And the click-through rate on this was about 20%. The interesting part is it's 20% on the charitable side, but it was also 20% on where do I find, you know, clicking on a button that says, where do I find this product? And that just would come up once you clicked on it. So this is another way to activate connected packaging, utilizing a connected product cloud, and then doing something that you want to do. I mean, charity for the community is an awesome idea. So we, we, are, jump in. We, are, we are very happy to be a part of this. Yeah, just to add to that as well. By the way, this can be upfront, all the upfront work on building the branding. And we, we work with him. And then this went through the Apple Cloud. Yeah. But the, the other piece of this puzzle was the ability to connect multiple assets during this journey. So the can was one of the big pieces of the puzzle. Obviously, it's a product that people can hold in their hand, but you might turn up at an event where this is the beer partner and they've got connected taps. So tap decals that sit in, in pure view of the customer, which you could then scan if you were using a plastic cup because it's been served as draft beer, for example. So activating their tap room was part of the journey. Uh, think of your distilleries and the ability to activate within that environment to connect to consumers that are coming for tasting experiences as well. So it's not just about the physical products necessarily. It's also the objects and assets that you guys own that people are really interested in. It might be the art piece or the, the still that's in the corner that tells a really amazing story. Let's automate that process. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's amazing too that we went through and put like five different pieces together and we did it so that it, it, it could do and, and record in different areas within their, like within the brewery or within the cans or without the cans out in the field or within in the brewery it themselves. So it, it really, it told the story from a data management standpoint as well. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I like the way you guys just took it from, it's not just the cans, there's other play, the other sort of experiences or places where these QR codes can, can live or the, where the connected packaging can live. Um, we had a question in the chat, so I just want to read that yeah, before we move on to the next section. Um, uh, Katie Allen asks, for yeah. a brand just starting out on the QR journey, what are the core KPIs that you'd recommend they look into in order to help define, define success? The first step, in my view to consider is a dynamic QR code, right? So something that's not just one that's been created based on, say your homepage, put into a QR code generator, that's my QR code. Just means if you wanted to extend that conversation or the journey with the digital content side of things, you've already limited the ability to do that because that QR is, is based on your homepage. So there's no flexibility to make a dynamic content set. So that's the first thing. Think about the connective piece. So how do I make that asset of mine really valuable now, but also into the future if we have to change direction with what we want to speak about? <clears throat> the actual KPIs component, it'll come back down to what's your own brand strategy and what are you trying to achieve in different markets? Are you looking for brand growth or new customers? Or are you looking to talk about the ESG landscape and the storytelling component or brand protection? They've all got different KPIs that can be bundled. Starting out, first thing that I'd be considering is, am I reaching my target audience? So the first thing there is, if I get a scan, how long are they staying? Are they engaged for a decent period of time? What content are they looking at? And is my content correct? So within something like Seller and Atmo as a combo, when you create a content block, for example, so an experience that you're scrolling through, each of those blocks has got its own ability to be a unique analytics collector. So we can see, did they press play on the video? Did they click the learn more button or the donate here button? Or did they even scroll down the page to see your social media links? We can just see that eyeball collection rather than 
just like the click upon the social media button, for example. So I would be thinking a little bit about what do I want my customers to take away from my product? And therefore, what would be a traditional metric that I could track? Scans, uh, the easiest <laughs> of all, obviously, because that's the first trigger. Once that scan happens, though, is my content right? Is it compelling enough for people to stay long enough or click to engage on multiple options within that experience? So thinking a little bit about that, scans for starters, double digit growth or double digit scans is, is kind of an ideal world. Unless you're talking stupidly big volumes where um, Coca-Cola, I think it is, that talk about this, where they want every product to have a QR code on it for various reasons, because what if 2% of my customers scan it? And you're doing 60 billion cans a day or whatever it is, <clears throat> right? So that data set's totally different to a smaller run where you've got 10 to 20 to 30% scan rates or 80% engagement rates. So um, it's got to come back down to your own goals and, and drivers as a business, but thinking about consumer engagement directly in the moment they're in. So we have yeah, about 20 minutes. I'm sorry, Chris, Scott. We have about 20 minutes left. I know I've, I've got two questions yeah. left on this. So Scott, if you want to do a quick answer, and then I'm going to okay. ask Chris the next question, and then let let you both ask the last question, and then we'll take it. Q&A. But let's try and keep it tight so we can make okay. sure we leave time for questions. Okay. Q&A. Thank you, Amy. I was just going to add to Chris's comment. Don't try to boil the ocean with this. When you do get into this, you start getting people in a room and say, "Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that?" Why and pretty soon you've got 10 ideas on the chart. And if you try to do all of them, they could get bogged down. That would be the only other comment. Otherwise, I agree 100% on what Chris said there. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, that was an excellent, <clears throat> excellent point, Scott. Um, yeah. <laughs> everyone likes to, everyone wants to do everything all the time, everywhere all at once, uh, yeah. but you can't boil the ocean. Um, but so Chris, you, know, we talk, you talked a little bit about, about the data when you talked about the KPIs. But like, what kinds of data do you get from the consumer engagement experiences? And then how can um, people, Discus members, use that data so that brands can create a, sort of a return on investment on their spend on connected packaging? <clears throat> Everyone's focused yeah. on ROI. Yeah, perfect. So it kind of ties back to, to Katie's question, which is the, the best part about this, is that people are asking about data, right? Whereas in the past, it just used to be, we'll market to an audience and we'll hope they, they see it, like a billboard or a magazine or whatever it might be, whereas now it's so traceable. <clears throat> so we have this luxury of being held to account, which is what we like about these things and these questions. So the prediction bit, the grow piece of the puzzle. Um, so anything, again, that whole scan data, we're gonna see time of day that somebody's picked up your product and scanned the QR code or tapped the NFC tag. We're gonna see time of day, the date stamp that goes with it and a rough idea of a location. Obviously there's data collection rules that we can't breach. So our systems are built within different ISO formats and obviously the GDPR rules and reg side of things that we can't identify an individual. Obviously, we don't know enough about them. But if you pick up a product using seller and you scan it, you're going to get an IP address lookup that says that they're in this state <clears throat> because of where their phone is routed, the tower is routed through. So this is the why the geotargeting can come to life. So we're going to see when the scan happens, the time of day, the rough location, right? So it's in this state. Um, you're going to see then again, all the content blocks that start to get engaged with or scrolled and viewed. You're going to see impressions versus clicks um, versus the engagement component. You're going to see this big world map then all of a sudden instantly appear with all these locations where your products are getting picked up and scanned, which is kind of fun to watch as well. Um, click through rates to me are really critical because that means that my story or the message that I've got on my content experience is resonating with the audience. Beyond that though, when we start to ask for, for permission, we get a competition running or a redemption running. For example, we're doing one-to-one -one redemption, get a $20 gift voucher based on a purchase of a product with a unique identifier. All of a sudden we get somebody's first name, last name and email address because they've entered this competition, but it's through permission. So now you've got remarketing opportunities on the back of your products where you traditionally would never get based on the list of retail systems and things that are happening around the world. So product off shelf, I'll see when it's scanned, I'll see the time of day, I'll see the content they're looking at, I'll see the engagement, how long it lasts, and then I'm gonna finally, hopefully, pick up their real first party data that we can start to use for remarketing purposes into the future. Super helpful. Um, let's see, let's get to the, my, my last question, at least for now, and then we'll open it up to Q&A after this question. So just everyone get ready, think of your questions and put them in the chat or be ready to raise your <clears> hand. Um, so this is one of the, my last question is around something that we here at Discus 
um, you have been talking about and a lot of people have been talking about across various industries, and that's the global shift in consumer expectations around um, healthier choices. So the spirits industry has you know, been reacting by implementing recommendations and legal frameworks to ensure that brands deliver more information to consumers so they can make the choices, make their own choices. So what does this look like for the American spirits industry and what can brands do now to ensure they can they um, are conforming to all the sort of new trends and sort of regulations in that? And, and how does how does the, um, the connected packaging help with that or can it? Mm. The, the first way it helps is the digitization component. So the ability to make change real time rapidly at scale. So if you make any change, and this goes for the content marketing experience, if you make any change in a platform like Seller and Atmo and you click save, the very next scan anywhere in the world is gonna get that new access to the content. So maybe you've won a new award, right? You can refresh your content real time. It's not about a sit and forget kind of strategy. But to go back to this piece, um, I know we focus really heavily on trying to make this as simple as possible from a data entry point of view. So brands don't need to be designers. They can go in and just enter some metadata um, for provenance. So where's the product from? What regions it's from? How old is it? What's the volume? What's the size? What sort of a product is it? Those kind of things that can then be presented in a way that's visually appealing to the consumer. So the key here is um, taking a legislation and then obviously building the technology layer into that experience piece that allows us to tick the box against the legislation. So in this example here, there's a couple of different slides to flick through, but you'll see that provenance detail entered on the back end on the right hand side, but it presents on the screen in a very different format. So as you're entering the data, it's starting to appear visually on the screen. The next piece is managing the smarter decision choice. So this nutritional information, ingredients, allergens in bold, so that people know that there's something there that's going to be um, a potential allergen versus then this, um, you know, the nutritional panel that lets you make those smarter choices around the healthiness of a product or what journey you're on, for example. But with this mix as well, then you can start talking about the responsible consumption um, against sizes. You might have information on recyclability. But all of this then is translatable into 24 languages. That's the key here, is that you've got every audience covered from a, I can make a smarter decision point of view because it's technology, rather than just being the single label on the product, which has taken up a lot of space with a nutritional panel and things on it. We can now digitize all of that so you can have a much cleaner experience for your consumers. And Scott, what you want to add something? No, I was just thinking about everything that you talked about here. And I know that there's this, a facts thing that you at Discus need to maybe get to this year. So this is one way to do it. Put the digital QR codes out there and that would provide that information. So that's that's something that, that I think about as a way. I'm always trying to figure out ways to help customers to do what they need to do. And at the same time, then the consumer's going, wow, this is really this is really interesting that they're doing something like this. So it's just something to think about for the, for the future and by, the way it goes. And by the way, right, so as we touched on before, if I pick up a product and I scan it in California, the legislation is different to if I pick mm -hmm. it up and scan it in New York, right? So again, back to that one size fits all QR approach, which is going to just deliver everything to the, to the consumer, the same thing every time <clears throat> with platforms like ours, we can really tailor and customize that experience. That's a whole helpful additional yeah, just point. To, just to build up one little piece on that, just to, to, to talk to the future. And you talk California, there's bottle redemption programs out in California now. So there's, this is not done today, but there are ways to potentially do that with this. If people get very creative. So just, just some things that this could help in the future for everyone. So I'm going to, this was super helpful, guys. Um, I think a lot of information, a lot of practical information that um, a lot of different industries, but specifically, you know, the distilled spirits industry and specifically craft distillers can use. Um, before we go to final wrap up, I want to just, just put it out there to see if anybody in the audience has any questions, please put them in the chat or, you know, use the raise your hand feature at, at the top of the screen and we'll get to those. And while we're, folks are um, finding the right, raise your hand or putting their questions in the chat, mm -hmm. um, I just wanna ask what, 
What are some of the major barriers to adoption of the dynamic and serialized QR codes on product labels? One of you all want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that. I think the major barrier today is just not knowing. I think you don't know what you don't know. And in this case, what you have is you have trusted advisors like Chris and myself that can pretty much tell you how to make that happen. So you might just put a static QR code on and all that's going to do is, like we both said, it's going to take you to a website and you're then dependent upon the consumer to find out you know, what you're going to need. Whereas if you're using a dynamic QR code, then you're going to get more information, geolocation, et cetera. And if you're even using a serialized QR code, which I think is coming in the future, then you'll know to the bottle or to the can or wherever the product is packaged in, who scanned it, where, and how. So okay. I think I think there's a whole broad range there, but but I you know for me it's it's something that we as trusted advisors would be very happy to talk to anybody about, and that would be awesome. my number one piece of advice. Is Great. To, so. Um, Thanks, Scott. So, so we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get to them in the next 13 minutes. I know there's questions in the Q&A in the chat. I'm going to take the questions in the chat first and then take the questions that are in the Q&A function. Um, one question is, have you implemented multi-language engagement options for brands, allowing the default language, you know, you know, English, Spanish, English versus Spanish versus French, to change based on where someone is when they access the dynamic mm -hmm. content? That was a good one. I like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. But the That's better way to think one. about that is to do with the user's device settings. So we'd much rather engage with the user based on how they've constructed their mobile experience. So if I pick up a product and I scan it and my default language is Spanish, guess what? <clears throat> I'm gonna be serving that content in Spanish. Then I can change it to English or to something else if I want to have a look at it in a different format. So it's really about the consumer. Again, it's this personalization piece and serving content that's totally relevant to that user on their journey. So rather than making assumptions for them, we go with the, the good hard facts of what we see. So just a different way to think about it. Does that make yeah. sense? Uh, I think so. And if not, the person will, will reply back in the chat with the Q&A. Um, next question is, if there is an existing dynamic QR code on a package, can it be reassigned to seller to get the individualized info? Yeah, I did respond directly to the guest on this one, but um, yes, okay. and we, we do this quite often. Whereas if it's a, if you've been smart enough, which is the key here, to have a dynamic QR code that is unique rather than being just based on your website, for example, yeah, we can we can bundle that in as a redirect process, which allows it to go through run itself through Atmer and seller directly. So, yeah, hundred percent easy to take them over and control them. Okay, another question: Are there uh, I think it's integrators or service providers that can help design the connected packaging journey and create content that would be delivered and the full circle to ERM and database collection of data. So you we do a at H <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to say real quick, like we do a lot of that at Avery Denison today. So when we talk about the people that we have worldwide, the 5,000, that's some of the things we do. And then we're spirits we engage people and teams like Chris to build the content but if it really came down to say an RFID enabled uh, content generation then we would help with that integration we have people all over the country and the world that do that Chris yes yeah. sorry yeah then need to step on you no don't be silly it's perfect it's the right response right so it's yes so full service opportunities exist within partnerships like what we have. Um, but you can also dive into the, well, which technology should I use? Is it a QR code? Is it serialized? Is it NFC? Is it RFID? Is it a combination of some of those? And how do I then integrate that into my packaging process? Or can you work with our bottling partner to help with that journey? All of those things can be covered within this, as you call it, integrator service, I suppose. Okay, okay. And there's um, one more question specifically to Chris. Chris, did you say that starting with a static QR code is not a good idea? Um, with a limited budget, how else could someone else get started? So I guess think about the difference between a static QR code, which is built purely based on your owned URL, versus a dynamic one, which you could create in a QR code generator, for example, which would mean it's got a shortened URL. So um, the ability to control that content rather than it just being a fixed 
URL based or a fixed QR code based on your domain. Um, so it's still static to a degree and it's, a sh it's called a shared QR code. So you'd have the same QR code across every product, which is again, perfectly fine. But if you're building that process and that journey out within a platform like Seller and, and Atma, we've got that geo-targeting ability. So it's not going to be the same message again every time. So if I pick it up in California, it can be different to Florida, as we said. So using the dynamic piece is really important there. And it can be done at the similar, well, same cost effectively, um, nice and cheap. So someone did ask about, so so digital uh, product identities, when do you think those will just become mainstream and, and sort of the norm? Uh, well, no later than 2027 <laughs> at this okay. point. Um, there's so much coming down the pipe okay. in that digital product passport landscape, which is hmm. unbelievably interesting. Um, we've got brands already, and I know Atma does as well, that are, that are geared up and ready to go. And they're actually participating in that landscape today because it's okay. going to be part of the process. It has to happen. Okay. So people can still get in. Um, there's another question that just popped into the chat. What is the incremental expense that comes with dynamic code versus static? I don't know who can take that. Incremental expense. So as in, I guess, if I'm thinking about this correctly, the cost of goods component. So if we're using unique or serialized QR codes, it's a digital printing process yeah, versus process, the yeah. old school, you know, um, re, yeah, re, the, the traditional printing offset method where it's, you know, you take the template and the theme and just keep snacking them out and printing them. So the, the digital printing might have a little bit of a, dif of a different cost, but the, the ability to generate those unique serial IDs doesn't really add a great deal of budget at all. In my humble opinion, that's all part of the licensing agreements. So we can deliver millions and billions of codes, um, it comes down to the digital printing run that might just change that price a little bit. Okay, great. I mean, yeah, so typically it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. I mean, Chris hit it on the, on the head that the, the digital process is, is, is able to do it and, and the, the cost will be incremental usually. Okay. And any final words from the two of you before I do a couple of um, sort of uh, announcements about the future? Hey, yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you, first of all. Second of all, we've got a huge amount of experience right now when we talk about our Atma Cloud and we've got 30 billion connected products to it. So when you're going out to build these systems that I hope you will build, make and just, just a recommendation, just to make sure that you talk to the experts that are doing it now and they have trusted advisors and basically, we at Avery Dennison and I know Chris at Seller can assist you in that process to make it more seamless and, and easy. And the end of the day, I think the results are gonna wow you. That's just personal opinion. <laughs> cool. Chris? And again, I mean, I'll resonate the, the thank you for yourself, Amy and, and Caleb for getting this organized. It's been a, a, a pleasure going through the process, but uh, my message is get started and we've we've seen and then heard through some of the comment feeds here that like we're new to this we're starting with this and it's like yes that's that's the whole point um we were in that position a long time ago as well now we've got so much experience that we can share there's so many good resources around you that can help you get through this journey in a small bite take a bigger bite take a bigger bite and make sure you're getting results that's the key so getting started is the is the critical piece and if I can say, um, you know, uh, Chris or Scott, can you guys forward to the last slide, which I think has your contact info on it? Great. And so while I uh, do sort of our wrap up, I, I, that way people can scribble down your contact information. Um, but I do want to just remind everybody, I'm going to thank Chris and Scott, first of all. This is a really interesting, very timely, very specific um, uh, webinar. So I appreciate all the insights that they shared. Um, and like, the, so anyone who registered for this webinar, um, probably early next week, we'll send you out a link to the webinar recording so that you'll be able to watch it again. And then, of course, the, the presentation will be on there and then you'll be able to contact Scott um, and Chris. Although if you want to get in touch with them beforehand, you can always email membership at distilledspirits.org and Caleb or I will um, make sure you guys get connected. Um, I'd mentioned that we have a February 28th webinar, February 28th webinar that's focused on tips and tools for facing global regulatory compliance. 
Um, it's February 28th, 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll feature speakers from Trace One, Brown Foreman, and Bacardi. And then um, next up, we'll, we'll only have one webinar in March, and that's because early March, March 4 to 6 in San Diego, will be the Discus Annual Conference that we're doing in spirited collaboration with Women of the Vine and Spirits. Uh, so there's in more information about um, the agenda and how to register on our um, on our on the discus on the distilledspirits.org website. So check that out. And then um, we will we will likely have a webinar later in March, but that we haven't finalized the date. Um, so the next confirmed one is uh, Wednesday, April 10th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, and it's going to be focused on spirited spirited innovation. The Art and Science of Improving Taste, Aroma, and Feel, and it'll be fe featuring uh, Discus Partner member, Steric Systems. So I just wanna put those few, sort of the future out there to everybody. Um, and again, thank you, Chris uh, and Scott, and especially thank you, Chris, for, for being up really late at night <laughs> or really early in the morning your time. Uh, so have a good night to you. <laughs> the rest of you have a great day. Thank you, Scott. Um, the, the webinar is now thank concluded you. and everybody can disconnect. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody.